So we've been on this journey for the last few weeks about having a clean slate. And that's, uh, we're going we're gonna to close that out today. And it's been an, uh, kind of a, an amazing journey. It's been certainly one for me, as uh, you know, I've been just, you know, part of what I, what I ended up sharing probably really wasn't the plan at the beginning of this series, but I think, you know, there's different ways that, that God had been speaking. And when we have a clean slate, man, it, it's like amazing. And it's not that God just wants to forgive our sins, although that's the major thing. He wants to help the clean slate in letting go of things in the past and the hurts and the pains. And he gives us a way to do that. And he helps us with that. Uh, all of which can be very difficult, certainly, and a, and a hard thing to do. But at the end of it, we have this clean slate, this, this new start. It's an amazing gift, right? Do you, do you apart from all of that, and just in a, in a real kind of earthly fashion, do you, do you remember anything like, like what was the most amazing gift you ever received? You know, I'm not asking you to shout that out. Um, but um, just, to, to, you know, thinking about amazing gifts. You know, I remember as a kid, uh, I really lucked out. Uh, in, in terms of, you, you, uh, you, some of you know this, but I have um, two brothers and a sister. One has passed away. Uh, the next oldest is like nine years older, you know, and, and my oldest brother actually just turned 80. <laughs> He's old. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, so, but by the time, so the, by the time I was like, in, in junior high, and I'm sorry, I, I just offended a whole, many pe- whole group of people here. <laughs> I was picking on my brother, not you. So, uh, <laughs> all of a sudden, there's this cacophony. I, I, thankfully, nobody's holding tomatoes or anything with their, in there. So. <laughs> um, but what that meant for me is being, you know, like I, w- I was not planned. You know, my mom was 40 when she had me, 10 years after my, uh, nine years after my next oldest, which is my sister. I still told her she saved the best for last. She just didn't know it for a while, you know, and, uh, but that meant as a teenager, actually, they were all out of the house and my dad was getting promoted. So I got some cool stuff for Christmas, you know. Uh, in one year, they, you know, they, they got me a movie camera, a movie projector, movie screen, because they, I don't know how that all happened, but, you know, I like making videos. I started doing this as a teenager. I, got, I, I have one that I'm sending out to have digitized uh, that I did when I was a teenager. I still have them. You know, that's so cool. That was an amazing, that was an amazing gift. Um, the other one, though, the first one that came to my mind was not that one. It was just the time where, when, when Kathy and I got married in 1980, uh, gold was at some premium, and our, our wedding bands were just really, in a, you know, cheap gold, inexpensive. We could not afford. Hey, I was on leave for McDonald's. Come on. Uh, and, uh, and so a few years, a number of years later, we... I thought, I'm going to surprise her with a, I never even gave her a diamond, okay? Uh, Couldn't even afford that, so our engagement ring was an opal, right? And uh, the wedding band started to wear out after the wedding, you know, not not that day, but, you know, within the next few years, they they were really wearing out. So I thought, I'm going to, we're in a position now, I'm going to actually get her a diamond engagement ring and a matching band, and... uh, I wanted to surprise her on Christmas, which was just so cool, you know. It, the problem was I was never, I'm never going to pick out a wedding band for her. That, that was just, that would be foolishness on my part. So I literally gave her a box with a diamond in it. That was it, you know, and she got to go pick all the bands and stuff like that. What I didn't know is that Christmas morning is I opened a gift and she had gotten me a new wedding band. How cool is that? You know, that was amazing. We know, we, neither of us knew about it. The jeweler almost messed up because he had both of these and had to know that, you know, don't tell one the other, you know. Don't, it's, the left hand has to know what the left hand's doing. See? You know what so that was kind of an amazing gift, right? And, and, but those are, 
They're all temporary though, they're good, but right, all the gifts we could think of are, are temporary. The gift God gives us is eternal. It's eternal life and it's, it's eternal. As, so as he cleans the slate for us, you know, it's an amazing gift. It's to have a fresh start, isn't it? Having a fresh start's an amazing gift, isn't it? It really is. Um, and, and hopefully, I, I hope some of you have decided to allow God to wipe your slate clean and, and go even beyond the sin, starting with the sin, but even some of maybe the baggage that we've been carrying around that keeps us from being everything that God created us to be, right? Some of you, maybe someone's listening here or uh, online and you're still wrestling a little bit with the cost. What's the consequences or the cost of following Jesus? I gotta tell you, that's a really good question. I, I think sometimes um, when I'm talking to people about Jesus, even some of you, and it could be a baptism class or anything, we want to focus on Jesus being our, our Savior, right? And he wipes the slate clean and all the sins of forgiving, but the truth is, of forgiven, and the, but the truth is there is a cost to following Jesus, right? You, you give up. Scripture even talks about that you die to yourself and live for Jesus. I remember, you know, talking to somebody and it was like, all right, what do I got to give up to follow Jesus, you know, to be a Christian? You know, that's, that's the kind of the common question, you know, sometimes. What do I got to give up? And, and he's not a Christian, so I want to go to be saved, to come to Jesus. You don't, in this moment, you don't have to give up anything other than come to Jesus and ask for forgiveness. The problem with that is, you know, the truth of the matter is, it's both answers. You, gotta, you don't have to give up anything right now, but the truth is, you gotta give up everything at the same time. You, you understand what I'm saying? And we don't, we shy away from that a little bit because we want them to come to Jesus, you know? But we gotta be honest and so, but you know, there's a cost to discipleship in following Jesus. It's not my will, but your will be done. That's what it comes down to, right? But the truth is, accepting God's forgiveness and allowing him to give you a clean slate is an is a incredible gift. It's a blessing. And while unknowns in our life might be a little scary, the freedom to start fresh is so rewarding. So as I just wrap this up, we're going to look a little deeper at how do we share that story actually with others? Because it's, it's not meant to be kept to ourselves. Um, and, and there's a s simple ways to, to share with others, you know, not force it on anybody, but in conversation to share with others what God's done in your life. So I'm, I'm looking at Colossians chapter 2. Right. Verses 13 and 14 teach us a little bit about what, what we are to do once we've received this amazing gift. All right. So... This is, this is what it says. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Jesus forgives us of our sins, right? And before that, we were dead in our sin and then he needs to, we, we all still, you, everybody here knows you still sin, right? Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a sinful nature now that is the battle that Paul talks about, like a war going on in our bodies, and, and we all get that. But then the next one says, then God made you alive with Christ. Made you alive. You were dead, now you're alive with Christ, and he forgave all your sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us, and he took it away by nailing it to the cross. Think about this, crucifixion, right? Jesus is nailed to the cross. And the Bible says he not only took our sin upon him, it actually says Jesus became our sin. So that means our sin was nailed to the cross. Isn't that amazing? Before we, before we accept God's free gift of salvation, we're all dead in our sins. And that means we're separated 
It's a relational separation from Christ. We're not in a relationship with him. Sin is the barrier. And in verse 13 says we were dead in our sins. So we are given a clean slate, and it says that we are raised with him through faith in the working of God. So Paul actually described it right before the verses we just read. I want to read that. It's verse 12. You were buried with Christ when you were baptized. Baptism symbolizes the burial and the resurrection. Okay? And with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Jesus from the dead. So before we have that new life, that clean slate right, that comes from Christ, we're dead because of ourselves. Listen, before a person comes to new life in Jesus... He's not a sick person who needs a doctor. The Bible says he's a dead person that needs a savior. Okay? And then it says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Trespass is kind of a, a, a specific kind of sin. It's overstep, tres, trespassing is overstepping boundaries, right? Um, we're dead because we overstep God's boundaries in our sin and rebellion. But he gives us a completely new slate when we accept his incredible gift of salvation. Read it from Isaiah, chapter 43. So this is what God says through the prophet Isaiah in, in, in chapter 43. I, I alone am the one who wipes out your wrongdoings for my own sake. And I will not remember your sins. I will remember your sins no more. There is great freedom, folks, in having a clean slate. When God wipes it clean, right? And, and, and so the Greek word actually translated wiped out, blotted out, uh, is a compound word that means to anoint. And the prefix now means completely the idea is that something was completely wiped over. And in the ancient world, the term was used for like the whitewashing of a wall completely. Or actually, it also means overlaying a wall completely with gold. That wall is now hidden, washed clean. And look at, look at what you see now, right? That's precisely what God does when he gives us a clean slate. And I, I think we all get this. When you get good news, okay, what do you want to do with that? You, you got to go tell somebody. You got to share it, you know? When we found out that, you know, Daniel and Vicky were going to have a baby, some of you know in, in those circumstances in your life, right? It's like when he says, don't tell anybody. It was actually, so Joshua knew about that before we did, right? Uh, <laughs> he's doing a dance back there. Yeah. So when they FaceTimed us and told us, I said, do you want us to get Joshua, who was downstairs? And he's like, well, Joshua already knows. And I actually, honestly, I was thrilled. I, I am so, it's so, such a blessing that Daniel would have shared that with his brother first. You know, I love that. Uh, right? But now it's like, we're going to get, we go tell people, you know. And of course you have to wait because you got to make sure they're telling you all, all that stuff. I'm sorry, it's no longer about you. We, we have to tell this story, right? It's a testimony. We, gotta, we, sh we want to share good news. I think we really have come to this place as a congregation, okay, where we know that so much. And we got to start asking the harder question. What's preventing me from doing that? because I do that with everything else in my life. I want to share good news. So what we call telling your story is just simply, we use the word testimony. It's just telling your story. There's, there's nothing spectacular about the word. It's just telling your story. And it's a testimony it can be a salvation testimony, how I came to know Jesus and how he gave me that clean slate. Or testimony can be, can I, let me just tell you what God did in my life yesterday. When Suzanne called me and said, hey, I got to tell you this story. 
It's a testimony, right? It's that simple. It's that simple. Um, and, and so it's just a conversation that hopefully it lends itself. You're not, again, you're not forcing it on anybody. But think about in your conversations what leads to something where you can have that type of conversation, a testimony. Because we do it every day of our lives. So I want to share, um, this is what I came up with. Right? I'm going to give you three stories, real short, of three married couples and how they met. Okay? They're just stories. But we like telling them. You know? The first one was my son Daniel. You know? Daniel, uh, some of you remember, Daniel, in the summer between his junior and senior year in high school, did a thing called Compass through Gordon Conwell Seminary and Gordon College. Spent three weeks away. Uh, it was probably the most nerve-wracking time as parents for him uh, because we couldn't communicate with him that he was going to be out in the Adirondacks for a week. He was going to be under the teaching of seminary professors for a week. And then he went to Nicaragua for a week. It's called Compass. Once he was at Gordon College, uh, Gordon College hosted reunions for everybody that went on Compass. Okay. So he decided to go to that, and uh, he was kind of iffy about it, I think, but he, he ended up going, and there was this girl there who did it the year after him, and she went. And in our telling of the story, she started to stalk him at that reunion. Okay. Her name is Vicky, right? And we joke about that. So you was, she admits it, though. So, no, I was stalking him. I was. Um, and they kind of, she was in high school. She's still a senior. She had done it the year before, that summer before. So she's still a senior. He's a freshman in college. And uh, she's about a half an hour from the college. But they kind of stayed in touch, you know, text whatever a bit. And, and that's about what it was. And then Daniel decided he's going to Grace Chapel in Lexington with a co for a conference with some of the other students that were getting rides there at, at Grace Chapel. Uh, I think it was it's probably simulcast, but like Francis Chan was a part of this and, and, and all of these. So he, he went there. Uh, and he, at one point, left wherever it was to go to the bathroom. And you know, in most places, the men's room and the women's room are right next to each other. And he's coming out, and who's coming out of the other one is Vicky, who's not there for the conference. She's driving. They're coming home. She's really got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> she goes to chat there. She volunteers there. She everything. So she knows. Can we just stop at the church? So and yeah, sure. And here they come walking out of the bathroom. And they're like, hey. And then about five minutes later, Daniel goes back inside, tells his friends, um, I'm leaving. I'll be back in time to get a ride because he's leaving with Vicky to go to her house to meet her parents. And you go, wow. How did, there's something about that story where you can go, you know, where's God's hand in this boy? But you, you either say this is highly coincidental or it's a God incident, a God incident, right? <laughs> Uh, then there's Joshua, Joshua um, and Janice, and Joshua and Janice went to, they were in high school, they were friends in high school, and uh, Joshua tells me, though, there was one time he asked Janice out, and she said no, and after that, they stayed very good friends, and in any time where one wasn't seeing someone, the other one was, so, but throughout these years, college, everything, they stayed really good friends, they were helping each other, maybe get through the breakup, whatever it was going on. And then Janice moved to Florida to, to go to school, and, uh, and the pandemic hit. And they were just talking on the phone, uh, FaceTiming, whatever they were doing. And, and Janice said, yeah, I really have one regret in our relationship. I said no way back when. OK, well, what do you want to do about that? You, know, you want to see if this will work. You want to test this out? You want to, you know, it's COVID. They're not, they're not, they're, you know. So they would have dates on FaceTime. Josh would order food, have it delivered. You know, they could eat together. It was being very creative through that, you know. But they're testing the waters. 
You know what I'm saying? And, and, and then he said, I'm, I'm going to, and he ended up flying down to Florida. And I go, you nervous? Because this is the first time you're together. And I remember saying to him, no, I, asked him, I said, are you nervous about this? He goes, no, we just figure we'll know for sure after the first kiss. Like, this is really weird. <laughs> or, okay, this is, this is, this is working. And so it was really weird, and they broke up. And, and uh, no, obviously he came back. He says, yeah, it wasn't weird. <laughs> and here they are married. There's a different story. For Kathy and me, um, Kathy, and me, she lived around the corner. She was not literally the girl next door, but almost. Our first memory together, we actually don't know how young we were. I remember going over to her house to play school. Not doctor, school. <laughs> because I think I was about five and she was three, or something. We were two years apart. Her dad still has the desk that we played school at. And we never, that's the only memory. We don't remember anything after that. I think it only happened once. Um, we went to separate elementary schools uh, until sixth grade where I had to go to her, the one she was going to. She saw me on stage in Glee Club in sixth grade singing There's a Hole in My Christmas Stocking as a solo. Uh, Two years apart meant we were often not in the same school at that time. And, and we started going to church together. And we all became friends. And as a youth group, we hang around in the neighborhood. We were all friends. Um, and then at 13 and 15, we became boyfriend and girlfriend. And parents, I know you're having anxiety right now. It's like, <laughs> and I understand it a whole lot better now, you know? Uh, and uh, went to college, and I did. And, and then I said, you know, I go going to seminary in Minnesota. I said, let's give this one year. She would have got married right out of college. Uh, came back, and, and I, I, you know, absence does make the heart grow fonder. I came back for uh, spring, uh, Christmas break from college in Minnesota, uh, from seminary in Minnesota. And I said, that's it. I, I don't want to be without you, so let's get married. And we got married that summer. Okay. By the way, my wife will tell you I never proposed to her. Because we have two very different definitions of proposals. That's why it is. I've got Joshua on video proposing to Janice. I get that. We've got pictures of Daniel and Vicky. And because it was all planned out, I'm just like, let's get married. That's a proposal to me, okay? Uh, <laughs> So, so, just so you know, thanks to, thanks to Bill taking pictures over Advent, um, there I am proposing to my wife in December to put this to rest, okay? <laughs> All right. Three stories. They're just... They're easy to tell, they're stories. As I was thinking of those though, it dawned on me that there's some similarities to our coming to Jesus story. For instance, Daniel's, and I think others could be much more so, but Daniel's story has a little bit more of supernatural drama to it. You know what I mean? There's like this, you know, a little bit more. And, and, and I think that sometimes we think that's what our testimony is supposed to be about Jesus. There was a time when, you know, all the rage of getting in people with the most dramatic come to Jesus story. I was in the mafia, I was a murderer, and, and that's, I'm not making that up, I've heard it. And it's an incredible story with a whole lot of drama in it. This is the Paul on the road to Damascus type story where Jesus just whaps them upside the head with a two by four, knocks them on the ground, spiritually speaking. And uh, Paul, the, uh, you know, who was persecuting Christians, is now a follower of Jesus. He, Jesus appears to him. But there are testimonies, aren't there, that, you know, there was a, a magazine I was looking at. It was an article called My Boring Testimony. 
And the guy, a kid, it was like a college kid, said, oh, my church asked me to give my testimony. His roommate's like, well, what are you going to talk about? Like, all oh, your drug addiction? I didn't have any drug addiction. Oh, well, what are you going to talk? Well, I just kind of go, well, you can't go in just saying that. That's boring. You know, it's like, and they had a before Jesus and after Jesus picture. It's the same picture. You know, that, that type of thing. We think sometimes it has to be this dramatic conversion story, and some are, and I'm not taking anything. Those are amazing. But that's not how everybody comes to Jesus, and that may not be your story. And I was thinking of, of Joshua, and it's like we, we, our story becomes one of, well, you know, I'm, I could have grown up in church, or I know, friends, I'm, I'm familiar with it. There's no antagonism there, you know, but I, I went through this time where I got to go, is this real? I test the waters, like Joshua and Janice are going, let's see if this works, you know? Um, and we test those waters and we come to that place of, of saying, okay, I, I, I'm ready to do that. There's no big drama. It's just the Holy Spirit working quietly in your, in your life to bring you to that place, right? And then there's my wife and I. You know, I grew up with Jesus. I joke, you know, I said, I was going to church before I was born, you know, because my mom went to church, you know, it's like, uh, and I grew up in church, I heard about Jesus, I got baptized, like many do, you know, and my wife will say, well, it was in that season, it was in the baptism classes where that kind of solidified for me, okay, um, but there was no big moment. There was no wrestling. It was just, I grew up in it, and now I'm saying, and now I'm just owning it. Because okay? there, there are some, I, I can't, Christians can be really bad with each other at times, right? Because we've heard someone say, well, if you can't remember the moment you're saved, uh, how ridiculous is that? I, I said, so, so here's the deal with someone like my wife and, and stuff. There is a moment. I don't remember it. I don't have to. I know I'm a follower of Jesus. I believe it's in my heart. He's in my heart. I don't have to remember the moment. God knows the moment that we crossed over, that the slate was clean. That's, that's what matters, right? But the problem with that is some of you think you don't have a testimony because it's my boring testimony. I grew up in church, you know? You know what? There are people that need to hear that testimony, not the dramatic one. Some people who hear the dramatic one go, yeah, I understand why you needed Jesus. I'm not, I'm not there. You know, you know, it's that type of thing. If somebody needs to hear your testimony, and you have one. And then it's important for us to have stories to say, and this is how it's still playing out in my life. Last week, this happened. You know, this is a God moment. This is the thing, you know. Um, so when God gives us a clean slate, we also now have room to see him at work in our lives. He's working out that salvation story continually in our lives now. Um, so I'm, I'm just think of it like this. This is what God wants from us, okay? You like popcorn? You know? You may not, but a lot of people like popcorn, and popcorn's one of those things where when it's popping and you can smell it, you know, you go, oh, you know. Um, popcorn, so let me, let me use popcorn to teach us this. Uh, think about this. Here's, a, here's popcorn kernels, okay? How many, how many of you like eating those? Yeah, popcorn kernels. Put your hands down. <laughs> You know, and if you get them left in the bag when you have it, you, you break your teeth. You know, it, it's like this is not. Uh, it's a seed. It's hard. It's tasteless, right? Um, but what happens when that tiny kernel meets just the right amount of heat? All right, watch this. This is in slow motion. That's at 4K slow motion. This next one is at 30,000 frames per second. Now, 
many of you watching that can actually begin to think how it smells, you know, on that, right? The aroma of popcorn. The seeds, the kernels are hard and tasteless. They can't be digested. And nobody, most people now I have to say, don't enjoy a bag of unpopped kernels, right? And this is kind of an image of you and me when we come to know Christ, right? Because really there's a purpose deep inside of us that God sees, that he put there. But until God wipes away the sins, it can't be uncovered. And at some point in the popping process, a change occurs. And all the potential of that kernel is released in us. Right? When God gives us a clean slate and washes the sin away, a change occurs in us. And we are free now to release the potential that God has placed inside us. See, not only do we enjoy the taste of freshly popped popcorn, especially at the movie's butter, um, but we can actually recognize its scent when it fills the room. That's the beauty of a delicious snack, right? It could be the baking of cookies or whatever it is for you, you know, but it smells as good as it tastes. And most people love the smell of popcorn in one small bag and fill the room and it smells so delicious you just want to taste it. Another word for smell is aroma, right? Do you know that God compares us to an aroma? In 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verse 15, <laughs> this is so great. To God, we are the aroma of the Messiah. How cool is that? among those who are being saved and among those who are being lost, for good or for bad. Okay. We experience it from a distance usually. It attracts us. We want it. We want to taste it for ourselves and like pop in popcorn. But in the same way, you and I, we, we are to follow Jesus and live our lives in his power of his spirit in such a way that Christ is noticed in us, Christ in us is noticed by others. Back in seminary, I told this many, uh, a long time ago, I was working at McDonald's, and there was this other girl working there, and she said to me, there's something different about you. And I blew it. I said, thank you. And I didn't tell her why. And I remember that to this day because I blew it as far as, you know. Um, so it makes me think of if somebody were to ever say that to me again, I've got to, you know. But my point in that story is there's no pride in that because I blew it, but it's she saw something different, you know, that, that you see from the world. Um, and hopefully there are people that see that and want to experience that themselves. And at that point, you can't just go, yeah, I'm a good person. You gotta use words to tell them why. Tell them a story. Tell them a story about Jesus has made a difference in your life. If you've never done that, here's your homework. Go home. I would say take a piece of paper. Most of you will go on your computer or iPads or whatever. And in one page, just write your story. Bullet point it. Timeline it. Whatever you want to do. Just to get your head thinking, this is my story. If you've never told it before, I don't know what to say, write it out. It will help you remember how to tell your story. It's, it's a simple exercise. If you want me to read it and help you with that, I'll make up stuff than you. No, I wasn't, no I'm kidding. Um, feel free. You know, I would love to help you with that. Right? So let's use God. Let, um, let, let us let God use us by being prepared. Let, let's stop being afraid to share the story of how God wiped the slate clean. Lord, we come to you and thank you for the story. 
that you're continuing to write in our lives. Thank you for the clean slate. Lord, I, 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 as I look at our congregation here, our church, there's some of the sometimes, Lord, I, I, I'm, so I've been having conversations. I think sometimes that the ceiling that keeps us from really doing this for you, the, the barrier, the ceiling, is got a name, and it's really our comfort. Our ceiling, our comfort becomes the ceiling. So, Lord, help us to break that barrier. Most of it's the fear of the unknown that doesn't actually ever happen. Help us, God, to know the story, to know we have a story, and that we can share that in ways that you will lead us, that others might know and have a clean slate as well. Amen.